Yeah, recording started. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to everyone who's here. We have what looks like maybe, yeah, over 10 people, so that's fantastic. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to switch to gallery mode. Excellent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. Super. So just as a quick uh, aspect of shopkeeping, you've probably seen the notes online already, but uh, last time when we met in the other time slot, which presumably is more beneficial to West Coast and um, Asian and African members of the group, we touched upon our oh, discussion of Clubhouse and whether that's going to be useful to us. Uh, Heidi, Heidi Peace, is she here today? No, she can't make it. But Heidi, I know quite well because we've organized events at UCLA before. But we're going to investigate that and set up some conversations on Clubhouse, which is designed more for um, a transient signal rather than something that you would might want to record and save for later. So that might be a, a useful promotional tool. Uh, we also talked a lot about uh, audio NFTs, which I want to get into more today. Um, we, all of this is in the recording if you want to see it. We discussed the complications of NFT licensing, which was certainly a, a, an involved topic. And lastly, whether or not NFTs might be permitted within what we call the closed gardens of streaming services. So our current streaming service is set up to deal with something that, um, what, what, is, what is presumed or perceived to be something of a legal complexity. I noticed that even breakfast television uh, had audio NFT, or not even audio, but NFT stories th this morning. Somebody said to me they saw on breakfast television, I wasn't quite sure what they meant, an NFT story. I see that CNBC had a story this morning about NFTs, but it was all to do with visual art. Um, there wasn't any discussion in there of, um, of audio. Has anybody, if you've, oh, Heidi is there. Where's Heidi? I'm here. Oh, you're there, you've appeared, or oh, you're one of the- I, I will the turn on my- black, One of the anonymous black avatars. Did you see the same story? The one that was, I, no, I didn't see that, but uh, I have definitely been eyeball deep in the, the NFT space lately. So uh, I can't keep up. And now Taco Bell has put on an NFT, <laughs> just- what, what's the Taco Bell NFT? Oh my goodness. They, I think they're the first brand, maybe somebody in the group, correct me if I'm wrong. They're the first brand to create an NFT um, and they have several of them. Um, they're visual renditions of their tacos. <laughs> That's, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> and, and then whoever the, the funds go to their nonprofit that they have, which think I want to say it promote provides scholarships or something to one oh, of the okay. members. But, uh, okay. but uh, I can see this as being the, the beginning of many of, of an avalanche of brands coming into the space. Uh, Brendan, I see behind you a, a Panini sticker. I don't know. Do you guys have Panini stickers in the in the States or not? Uh, we do. Although in the States, we're uh, mostly known for our trading cards. Right, and I know that that's a, that I've already seen some discussion. In fact, it was quite early discussion of NFTs and baseball trading cards, right? Because of the the high rate of forgery. That's right. So we're we're doing it. We're we're selling uh, digital only products. Uh, we're calling them NFTs. They're on a private Panini blockchain, which is a Hyperledger Sawtooth instance. Um, we've enjoyed a lot of success in our first year of operation. And uh, we're really excited to see the mass adoption, accelerating adoption of the, the NFTs. Um, I have been working uh, uh, for a, a few years with uh, uh, Sebastian Post here on this call. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sebastian, for the introduction and, and getting me involved here. Um, so Panini, for those of you who don't know, is a, um, I guess about a 3 billion euro global company that um, is the leader in sticker albums and trading cards. And so we make collectibles and managing scarcity and all the benefits of an NFT and the, the, that technology uh, confers a lot of benefits to um, a collectible where scarcity is the game. Scarcity is what we, we have to depend. And so, um, but connected with that, I'm looking at everything and evaluating across the, um, uh, I have a very comprehensive view of 
the space and the, the, a lot of the path dependencies for digital collectibles in general and uh, creator platforms as well. So really excited to be uh, connected with this group and excited to, to see what we can uh, do together. Yeah, I'm obviously having grown up in the UK, I know Panini from, from players, right? So you collect, sure. you buy a little packet, you open it up and inside of, is a small number of stickers from any number of teams, any number of players. And sooner or later you start to get duplicates. So you start to swap them and then you stick them all in, a, in an album and then the album becomes something of hopefully collectible worth in the future. So I can see how the parallels with baseball cards are enormous. Um, yeah. Did you just want to tell us how, we, because obviously a lot of these a lot of this infrastructure could be applicable to the other audio or let's say uh, visual um, projects that we're hopefully going to engender very soon. But what can you tell us about the actual Panini blockchain? Well, so it's a, a Hyperledger Sawtooth uh, instance. We've got to set up in a dual node configuration. We're uh, using the APIs to construct um, an issue and uh, to mint. Uh, we're not really making use of the smart contract infrastructure, although we certainly can. We chose Sawtooth because we saw it as a really great platform to federate consortium, and we still have that as part of our roadmap. You know, we're gaining our own technical understanding of, of what's possible with the technology, and maybe um, as important, the custody of items, and um, as a mass market uh, company, you know, having uh, bare instruments in a wallet where if a user loses their keys, uh, that, that, that's catastrophic in, you know, the conventional world. Now, obviously, there's a lot of new wallet technologies and uh, that, you know, with uh, social recovery and different uh, ring signatures and that sort of thing. But um, the, those two aspects are what really led us uh, towards Hyperledger Sawtooth. Uh, I'm a non-technical executive that reads all the white papers. So I'm not gonna be able to uh, talk about uh, much more about our um, implementation. I've, I've got a, a team of people that um, uh, have built that out. And so far it's scaled and done everything that we needed to do. And it, we stood it up really fast. We've been really pleased with it. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, pulling in some other people, you know, some, some other companies and, um, having a consortium around that. We don't have any dates around that yet, but it's something that's um, uh, a really important possibility around what we're, what we're building. What led you to the choice of Sawtooth um, for a media project like this? Um, so we were looking at Um, and we're glad we didn't choose them. Uh, Loom Network, I guess, is go going through a recovery. Matic was out there. Um, it, it just, it felt like fr from our standpoint, um, having the, the foundation and the open source and a lot of enterprises using the platform, those, those were pretty compelling for us. Uh, we weren't, when we looked at it and we looked at the decentralized technology, and by the way, I'm all in on the decentralized stack. I'm really excited about it and want to embody all the, the values that, you know, that are wrapped up in um, DID and, and uh, decentralized systems. Um, but representing a 120 year old category with a 60 year old brand, which is Panini, uh, we felt like we really needed uh, something that was a little more tested that we had um, more control over. And that started shrinking the decision space pretty quickly uh, and there were a lot of third-party vendors that could have, um, um, that, that wanted us to take a look at them, but I, I basically landed on um, uh, Hopperledger because of the, um, um, the foundation and the community that, that it came from. Did your choice have anything to do with, um, let's say the, the earlier choice by Verify Media to choose Sawtooth? Does that ring a bell, that company? Verify Media. No, I don't think so. Mm -mm. It just, just if, if you look at the earliest um, promotional materials from, uh, from Hyperledger, one of the things they say they hope they can do is work with uh, music attribution. And they point to a, 
a joint UK-US venture called Dot Blockchain Media. That has come and gone, but a lot of the guys okay. who worked for that now work for a company called Verify Media, V-E-R-I-F-I. And I, as far as I know, they're the only people working with Sawtooth on a media-related project, unless somebody wants to correct me on that. Does anybody know anything uh, that's more up-to-date or more correct? No, okay, I, so I'm not familiar. Okay, well, David's there. Oh, David's jumped on. He, he doesn't. Okay, so maybe I'm right. So yeah, that's the other big Sawtooth media project that comes to mind. Um, what about your collaboration with Sebastian here? Well, where did you guys find common ground? Well, I can I can handle that, Sebastian, if you like. Um, so why not? Yeah. So um, uh, Sebastian re reached out to us, I believe, or we found each other somehow. I don't ex remember how, but we um, in in our space there there are we're creating these. We create 300 plus thousand unique um, trading cards uh, a year. Now, th these are designs. Well, there, there's actually about maybe 4 billion physical cards are created. But these, um, these designs, uh, they can be worth uh, a lot of money. And the, the, the overall category, people that don't know the trading card category, we're selling cards that are worth um, millions of dollars okay in the aftermarket within maybe when they're pulled from a pack um and the overall market just recently was uh, recognized as being as part of the luxury good category and again it's because the overall demand there's this ongoing financialization of our product where people are looking at it as a viable inflation resistant um real alternative real, uh, real alternative investment it's a property it's a new investment class. And so because of this, um, we're seeing people take images, false images, and they're putting them up on eBay and they're selling fake cards and they're pilfering and stealing and, and, um, uh, and you know, very much like the, the rest of the um, uh, uh, luxury good category has experienced, you know, when the, when the, the values get high enough, uh, it gets really profitable to come in and knock it off. And so, uh, Sebastian with the, with the ISCC and, and then with Lysium gives us a whole new level of um, identification that we can use um, to actually track and um, give our consumers some chance of actually um, validating what they're looking at, that it actually originated from Panini. Um, and so th 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 and that's really, really valuable for us. Now, there's a lot of different uh, physical authentication technologies that we can use, uh, uh, like diamond dust and high resolution photographs and that sort of thing, but they don't solve uh, our eBay problem. They don't sort, sort, uh, solve our aftermarket problem. They don't solve um, the the other abuses that happen with our property, and because we're using a, the officially licensed marks and logos of all the top licensors in the world, like. FIFA and NFL and NBA. Contractually, we're obligated to use, uh, you know, the 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 best available technologies and to to uh, take care of their property. Okay, so our car, our, when we make our cards, uh, we own them, but they also have an interest in them. And so there's a convergence of of um, market forces, um, uh, protection of um, our of our graphical assets. Of, of our files. I mean, we've got a back catalog that runs to many, many decades. And, you know, if that gets out and we, it's really important for us to be able to make a public claim um, and, and to be able to um, verify that, yes, we had ownership and possession of a particular asset, you know, so that we can defend it in, in the marketplace, not just legally, but just to re represent to others that we're actually being good stewards of the of the property and sebastian could, so that, that's a, yeah, yeah go on i'm i mean just uh, um mentioning uh, again that the icc um uh, originated from 
uh, this um, challenge to uh, to manage uh, a huge amount of uh, content or assets, digital assets, um, and uh, to to have identifiers for um, for assets that um, have not uh, mm, or where traditional identifiers uh, like ISBNs or DOIs or or uh, ISRCs for 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 music. Uh, where they have not been applied, and so um, uh, that that's that's uh, one thing. And to have a identifier to generate uh, or to come up with an identifier standard that is um, able to handle uh, the fact that uh, through the internet, online digital media is being transformed, uh, compressed, uh, converted uh, to to other file formats, and still uh, retain some some kind of similarity, and that at scale uh, and. Another point is to uh, have these um, identifiers being able to be used on blockchains and in decentralized environments where anyone can regenerate uh, uh, and come to the same um, ID uh, in order to, to transact, even if you don't have any kind of relationship. Uh, um, that, that is for me uh, one of the most important uh, points that in tra traditional media business, you would manually manage identifiers and then try to get an to an, come to an agreement with the third party or with the other uh, party uh, about the content and the term. That was uh, um, uh, seeing what what will come in the Web uh, 3.0 um, way. Uh, this has been the. Um, uh, origin of, of the ICC and, and Panini is of course uh, one of the, the the media companies with the I would say probably the most uh, digital uh, or physical assets in in terms of the the, the sheer volume of of, of, of assets so uh, Jerome you had um uh, some observations about the ways that this might help us. Plus, you had a question about French soccer. <laughs> yes, um, I've been um, asked to, to watch some uh, solutions that appear um, uh, in France. So this is, these are my students who asked me to, to check what is a NFT in the concept of uh, uh, the equivalent of Panini cards uh, in France. And uh, I've started... Uh, uh, deep diving of how this solution was working. So it's based on Ethereum. There is one smart contract that is used to generate some uh, some, uh, some NFT and cards. And uh, as far as I uh, understand, um, they are given a token ID. So I, I don't really understand uh, very well how it works now. Uh, so I would be interested to see uh, if there are some uh, alternatives with uh, Hyperledger Sotus, maybe uh, without any uh, smart contract. Uh, I don't know. So if uh, Brandon has uh, some uh, some uh, technical information uh, to, to share with us, I, I would be very interested. Thank you. Well, th this speaks to one thing I was going to share, that we can always schedule a presentation if we want to, uh, um, you know, give space in a meeting and then, you know, you could present and do a demo. You're welcome to do that now, but if we schedule in advance too, we can also promote it out on Hyperledger's channels and get more of an audience for this too, if we wanted to do it at a future meeting. So, you know, we haven't, we as a group haven't had guest uh, speakers yet, but that's something that other special interest groups in the community have done, if there's interest in that. Is that something, is there something, Brendan, that you guys might do? Is there something you could share with us, whether it's text yeah. or? Yeah, for sure. No, I'd be happy to uh, walk everyone through the panini um blockchain cards the nfts and um i can could give a, a demonstration and and you could see it. it it's very accessible i'm always happy to talk about what else is happening in the space um and we could cover the, what's happening at so rare uh they've enjoyed a lot of success they just raised 50 million dollars uh to go grab more licenses and um you know they're enjoying a lot of success there's a lot of questions that whether um, a fantasy card is really a collectible. I have a lot of questions about the uh, technical and legal construction of just about everything in the NFT space. Uh, there, there's a lot of issues around them that make me think that they don't belong in the collectible category. Um, and I think it's definitely something uh, uh, conceptually 
that this group needs to, when, when we talk about NFTs, um, there's kind of a, a, a taxonomy of, of those and we need to be clear on them. Everyone's, in the, because this has emerged so quickly, we're playing really fast and loose with the language and what is an NFT to me is not an NFT to you. Um, uh, I have NFTs in my wallet that I bought early in the space about two years ago. And now I have nothing. I have a token, but the underlying assets and the project got taken down. I've got nothing. There's nothing to show for it and no recourse. And well, that's it. And um, frankly, that's the exact same thing you get with Top Shot. Um, and I haven't done the deep dive on so rare, but I've got concerns about it. But anyway, we've got there, there's a lot to cover and be happy to do uh, to have a, a special section and kind of uh, uh, present on on what we're doing and how we're seeing it. Well, that's great. Uh, maybe uh, maybe David and I can take this offline and figure out what works with your calendar. Do you, do you want yeah, to drop sure. your email address in the chat and then David and I will yeah, reach out? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, Heidi is our sort of unofficial in-house NFT detective. What's your, what's your view of the last week been? Well, I personally, and I agree with what you were saying, Brendan, is that, that my definition of an NFT is very different than the person down the, down the road. And, and I think that we're headed for a, the bubble bursting, my personal opinion, um, just because as I've been exploring these different platforms, there are hundreds of thousands of, right now, visual artists trying to create and sell their NFTs on this platform. And it's really, there's a lot of noise and uh, the demand is exceeding, or the supply is demand is exceeding the, the, the demand. So um, unfortunately, my opinion is, I think we're gonna see the bubble burst like we did with ICOs. Um, but the bigger opportunity is for the non-blockchain, non-crypto community, because right now really the most activity has been with, the, with crypto holders. And I think that this now makes people better understand who are not in blockchain better understand, oh, here are some actual use cases. So um, once the bubble bursts in the crypto community, I personally believe that we are headed for tremendous opportunities it, not just with visual artists, but I personally think there's even more opportunity for the for musicians. And I've been pinged left and right by um, talent agencies, um, venue uh, people that own venues for musical uh, concerts, as well as a musical rights companies that have been pinging me the past two weeks, wanting to get into the space. So I think, um, and, and I can share with you some of the ideas that they've been presenting to me, if you'd like. Yeah, please, go on. Okay, so um, obviously we have the utility on one side of an NFT is the collectible aspect of it and hopefully reselling it on the secondary market. On the other side where we're seeing, so, so yes, so we're seeing like the Kings of Leon and they've launched their music, uh, hope, hoping that, that um, some of the items that they've launched as an NFT will become a collectible and you can sell it on the secondary market. But what a lot of these talent agents are saying um, is we're looking at an NFT that has a lower price point that would really be used more as a key, a key to engage fans like we've never seen before. So that would be things like, um, I'm buying, you know, Heidi Band NFT key, and that means I can engage with, with Heidi, uh, the band. I can maybe attend a Zoom lunch, or it gives me access to a concert down the road in the future. When I'm at the live venue, perhaps the band airdrops a release of their new song that hasn't been made public yet. Perhaps it gives them VIP backstage passes. Um, sometimes it could be used for things like special photographers at the actual concert. Um, maybe they issue a, a, an original photo that's given out to the NFT holders. Um, so it, the thought is really, oh, and then of course, throw in brands. 
and product promotion and how money can be used, uh, uh, how money can be generated and monetized from the brands. So that's really the buzz that I'm hearing right now is this shift a, a little bit away from the memorabilia, which I think will be there for the long term, but it's how do we get fan engagement? Um, and then obviously royalties which that's a whole nother discussion as well that I'm sure John, you know about much better than I do. I, I, I think I'm right in saying that those um, Kings of Leon NFTs, the, they include a, a ticket for lifetime, is that right? So if that's correct, then um, from the fans point of view, that's obviously the, the longer term benefit. You've got the collectible, but you know, then month after month, year after year, what, what you, you're interested in is fan engagement from, you know, the fans point of view. Eric, you just put up a link. Would you like to contextualize that? Right, just uh, talking about the fan engagement, there's a company out there called Socios. And that is their, their sort of focus is, is doing partnerships with sporting teams, mostly soccer clubs or football clubs and issuing these tokens that allow the fans to be engaged um, so they're not actually issuing anything behind those, any sort of media assets that are attached to those tokens, as far as I know, but um, just sort of following on the, the, the opportunity for fan engagement. Do you have a sense of um, the, the, the two key points, which are how much do they cost and what does somebody get? Yeah, so, I, so as far as I know, they, um, They'll, they'll do a deal with the club and, and sort of determine how many tokens do you want to issue and figure out according to their fan base and, and all that. The fan, uh, sorry, the clubs will use those as part of their marketing efforts and either give, uh, give them away as promotionals or allow uh, fans to, to buy tokens. And then with the tokens, you get access to voting on, um, you know, halftime performers or uh, you know, uh, player appearances and things like that. So it just it just made me think of, of that. I've I've talked to them uh, a little bit last year, so I'll kind of follow up and see if they're into NFTs. But it's it's not so much music or or media. But uh, just wanted to throw that out there. It certainly could be something that a that a musician or a musical collective could use or a venue could use, right? Mm, right. In terms of guaranteeing long-term interest between the fan in question and the band or the venue in question. Right, yeah, so it's more about giving access rather than owning anything. It's sort of like voting rights. Heidi, yeah. Interesting, Eric, I, I, the, I worked with the startup or I met with the startup from two years ago that they had purchased, I wanna say it was indoor arena football here in the States. I think that the first team that they purchased or worked with was out of Salt Lake City and they were using blockchain for fans to vote on things like does the quarterback throw the ball deep or do they pass the ball and uh, it, they were using blockchain because the last thing that in the world that they ever wanted was to be accused that they manipulated the vote in any way because fans would go insane. So um, I think that they're also doing something similar to the socio space, um, but, but very interesting. It's funny you mentioned that one thing I've always wanted to see is a decentralized soccer team. So no manager, but if the fans could actually pick the team, decide who gets substituted. So it was real time. But then obviously, like you were saying, what you would need is some indication that the, the vote wasn't being skewed or just you know grossly manipulated by um, more powerful parties. So I would totally invest in that if I had the opportunity to physically pull off the crap players and put on the good ones. That'd be really great. But Heidi, yeah, you were saying you were sort of in the middle of your um, uh, report. Oh, yep. So I guess that um, more back to the issues of the NFTs that we see happening right now, which have been for the visual digital artists. The biggest challenge that I'm hearing um, is the cost of gas, um, which has really been prohibitive for most of these artists entering. Well, I guess I should say number one, the biggest uh, barrier to entry is the technical understanding, downloading a MetaMask uh, onto your computer, buying Ether, uh, that, that it's, 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 um, 
a huge barrier of entry for many, many artists. And, and then second is the gas fees that I've been hearing, you know, range anywhere from 70 to sometimes $200. Um, so that's been a problem in the space. And um, the other, on the other side, where people are, the, the patrons are also, they have to own Ether or crypto. I think that there are only two sites that I'm aware of that are at least have enough traction behind them that are accepting credit card. Um, so like I mentioned, oh, and that doesn't include the NBA Top Shots. But so for the most part, I think that the community we see right now, they are crypto holders. Um, and one, a couple of items that I don't think have been fully addressed and that I'm, 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 I'm worried about is, well, what happens when somebody attacks some of these, um, the uh, custody of these NFTs and steals the NFT? Also, what happens if somebody imposes as one of these artists, like somebody comes in and, and as an imposter to people? Um, the other, we have not seen, I haven't personally seen on any of these platforms tax taxes applied on. So I, you know, I don't know what that means. And then we're also facing, or I'm hearing a lot of issues about copyright infringement. Um, so in particular, in one of the groups that I'm part of, somebody owns some original footage of Michael Jackson's Thriller video. And he wants to sell this as an NFT. But now there are all sorts of issues around, can he actually say it's Michael Jackson? Um, because what about the Michael Jackson estate? So there's just a lot of hurdles that I'm just waiting for something to happen that um, is going to cause a, you know, a lot of disruption in, in a bad sense in this space. Would somebody like to address that tension between all of the excitement that we're seeing on one side and the complications that Heidi mentions, all the way from legal challenges to the, 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 the pure complexity of making these things in the first place. I'd be interested to know whether we slide towards a more optimistic view or whether we think that in fact, this is something of a bubble that for any number of reasons might um, prove less worthy than it would like to consider itself. Well, I'm happy to jump in. I've spent a lot of money on attorneys in the last year to talk about these, these issues as we step into the digital collectibles. And it's one of the reasons why I've been reading so many terms and conditions is because I'm trying to understand how Panini measures up. Because I've got a real strong conviction that we, as, as, the, as the adults in the room who aren't moving at startup speed, um, you know, we're moving at enterprise speed, and that means that, you know, we're, we're, we're behind in some ways, but we're ahead in others. And in the ways we're ahead, it, it's, it's around the, uh, the legal commitment to what's happening. Um, you know, I heard the term class action lawsuit thrown around today in the community that I'm talking about because of people uh, representing things that were collectibles but aren't a collectible or representing that you, um, uh, when you enter an ecosystem, what are the commitments to actually um, exit the ecosystem? And do you have, um, uh, what do you actually own? And when you put your money in, how, how do you get it out? These are all real, you know, basic, simple business propositions that we gotta, gotta iron out. But I think there are a lot of um, uh, uh, vendors out there, marketplaces, where there it is. It's really uh, legally it, it's um, difficult. So we had there was a company called Crypto Strikers that was probably the very first um, uh, stickers, to, if you will, uh, of uh, FIFA stickers. And this was in 2018 and uh, crypto strikers came out and instead of uh, they tried to uh, skirt the copyright issue by using cartoons of the players and they had some original art uh, used and so that they didn't have to get the um, uh, the photos and the, the licenses around it that was challenged legally and the, the project was taken down um, i know the founders um, i lost money on on my in on my um, crypto collectibles 
and and this 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 is the problem and um and heidi what you were talking about with how do you certify um the who's actually generating the the content how do you know that it's official content and this is where i go back to what sebastian's doing is because you in the future you're going to have to make some public claims uh about uh, um some immutable claims about what you produced, what you created. Like here, I am the source of this thing, yeah. um, either as an individual or as as a as a company or as a DAO. You're going to have to make those public claims. Um, it and, and you and you can have if you have the keys, you can prove it, right? Other otherwise, you you don't have much to stand on. Um, the so when we look at uh, is it uh, nifty um the 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 nifty gateway uh, nifty yeah nifty gateway so nifty gateway is curating their list of artists um but if you drill down and try to uh, understand well okay so they're selecting lots of inbound people representing themselves to be someone mm -hmm. but you know are, are are they actually going up are they actually going to the listed address and making sure that that's not uh um you know the the the, the local um uh, bagel shop. I mean, what what does their due dil diligence look like? Um, I've talked to the um, CEO of um, Christie's recently, and they, you know, they just recently listed um, auctions. Um, and you know, in in they're dealing with the same issues that other large enterprises are that are trying to operate in this space, um, which is. Uh, um, so you have the, the KYC and the AML, the know your customer and anti-money laundering uh, provisions. And as a business, how do you handle that? If you use pu uh, public payment gateways, you know, you're offloading those functions to them. Um, some legal, uh, I guess, insulation uh, from, from that kind of risk. But when you start taking uh, crypto payments and you're, um, you know, depending on how you want to do that, uh, there, there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of open questions among people that are really trying to get into space about what can be clawed back. You know, so I got a two and a half million dollar payment from for a piece of art and I, I accepted crypto and it turns out that it was fraudulently obtained. What how does and it's cross border. Um, those are cross border payments. I mean, I mean, it's a zoo. I mean, it, it, these are really complicated issues. And as a business, um, uh, you, you can get a lot of concentrated risk and are in a real hurry as you step into the, this, this new business model with uh, NFT collectibles. We, we think we're in a pretty safe spot, but, um, but that changes really, really quickly. The, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is if you look at the terms uh, of service for all the major providers, um, you'll be astonished at how much technology risk you're assuming, which is basically all of it. You know, if if the public, if your transaction uh, gets foiled or lost or has some minor extracted value um, assault on it or what whatever, you know, you can very you can you can have a failed transaction and the company that you're dealing with is completely indemnified in in all the top ten uh, terms and conditions that I've read. There, you accept all the technology risk, all of it. It's yours, and um, and so they can't guarantee a, a a customer experience. And you know, if you have a failed, you know, five, six, seven, eight figure transaction, you know, what recourse do you have on a on a decentralized uh, platform? Especially because you don't, you can't see. Um, or you may not have access to how they're executing it on the on the back end. You don't know. Um, uh, I guess in some cases the smart contracts are uh, vetted, in some cases they're not. Um, anyway, the, the point is that there there's just there's a lot of risk. You know, it's still such early days. But as we look at um, expanding beyond just a private uh, blockchain and, and, and creating um, uh, a gateway or on ramp to the public chains. Um, you know, we're stepping into that world and we have to change, we have to have separate terms of service just because we can guarantee what we're in control of and we need indemnification from all the things that we don't 
control, and which is shockingly a lot. <laughs> There's a lot you don't control when you get out onto the, the decentralized blockchain. Jerome, you had a quick technological question and then Sebastian's got his hand up after that. You asked about uh, people's chosen technology for the creation of NFTs, right? Yes, that's right. Just uh, to, to know what are the alternative solutions to ERC721 uh, and uh, the solution uh, mentioned by uh, Brandon today. So I don't know many others. So if you know many others who are very uh, key, uh, please just let us know. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, Jerome, could you restate the question? I, I didn't follow it all. Okay, so uh, assume you, you want to set up an NFT now. Uh, the question is which technology uh, will you use? So the most obvious one is ERC721 by Ethereum and uh, ID mentioned all the drawbacks of this technology in terms of code, gas, and so on. So uh, what are the alternative technologies that may be used uh, and uh, what, what is done exactly with Hyperledger Sotus and are there other technologies? I don't know if we can do that with uh, IOTA or any other technologies. So thank you. Yeah. So it's it's so for me, I'm looking at, at a lot of different solutions, um, and you know, so Panini, uh, we're we're maintain, we're we're publicly saying we're we're technology agnostic, and um, if uh, there is one uh, blockchain that that is uh, better, we can use that, and we can switch if we need to. Now the switching is can be tricky, and so. If I had to choose just one right now, I'd be really uncomfortable because there's no obvious choices, in my opinion. Uh, Ethereum is strong, but the, the gas fees are prohibitive. And uh, for a lot of our products anyway, at the price point we're dealing in, uh, you know, those fees are, are prohibitive. It's a non-starter. Um, so it's not an option uh, from the beginning. If we look at the, the, the layer two um, uh, chains that are out there, uh, I like um, everything ArcX. They're using zero knowledge proofs for uh, level um, uh, layer two solutions. And I really like the, the speed of execution. They've demonstrated uh, with Reddit and some other um, public use cases that they can handle. Uh, they can mint 10,000 um, NFTs per second. So that's strong, that matters. That's a, that's a real breakthrough in performance. Uh, they've got a computationally asymmetric zero knowledge proof of their own design uh, that they published a couple of years ago. It's a company out of Israel. Um, Yuri Kolodny is the CEO and they're, they're just, it, it's such a modern company. Um, it's, it's fantastic. But what, what they're actually implementing is pretty amazing. I like other layer two solutions as well. So you've got optimistic rollups. Uh, Matic is doing this um, uh, near protocol. Is, is another one I'm talking to the people at near uh, regularly. Um, if I look at some, some of the, the, the emergence of cross-chain technologies get me really excited because those let me like Cosmos and some others, I think Polkadot is another one. Um, uh, the, everything Polkadot is doing is, is looking pretty interesting to me. In fact, I think I've got a call coming up with them in 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> And it's really, you know, I'm just trying to understand what's happening in the, in the market. But, um, you know, the, the cross chain is exciting because it's going to um, reduce a lot of risk for those of us who are trying to engineer systems in the space. And, you know, it, for those of us who are old enough to live through some of the other um, uh, technology booms, Man, in the early days of the internet, you could pick a, a language or a platform and you would engineer with it. And two years later, it didn't matter. And, you know, you just, you know, poured 20,000 hours into it. And that's it's a lot of technical debt on something that's never going to go the distance. And that's that's the concern. That's what we've got to manage. But these cross-chain technologies, um, are, are they hold out the promise that if we want to move or let, let users um, um move across chains that they'll be able to. Near protocols already implemented some of this. Sebastian, your question, you had your hand up. Yeah, it, it, it was just a, a, a 
footnote uh, to what Brandon said uh, uh, earlier regarding the um, certification uh, um, uh, the necessity to to certify. Uh, the uh, I just wanted to mention that interestingly, um, the uh, Kings of Leon uh, offers on OpenSea they have not been certified. Uh, until I think uh, last uh, Friday, so there was on Discord on the Discord uh, um, uh, channel a lot of confusion. So uh, uh, why is it up there? And it has a it has a mark that says now certified, but it said uh, unverified collection, and and people were uh, getting all the attention from the Rolling Stone uh, post, and then were going to Open Sea, and it says unverified collection, and that. Um, uh, obviously, they changed it uh, through a manual certification process, and that I think is, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, an interesting um, uh, insight. That currently, that is a manual process uh, to to verify that actually there's a re relationship between the rights holder or, or the, uh, let's say, the, the the registrant of that offer and the the content itself, and that is something where um, uh, I, I spent the last. Uh, one one and a half years on on um, uh, suggesting uh, the the OCCP the Open Content Certification Protocol, which kind of um, allows you to connect uh, uh, or to solve this attribution uh, uh, problem in a way that is scalable um, and that does not need to rely on a, on a manual um, uh, um, process of of this certification. And the second thing that also uh, could be solved or could be is worth necessary to discuss is the the, the issue of the terms. So if you look at the current um, offers, it's very hard to understand what you're actually getting. And, and also Brandon mentioned that, but if you read it, even if you are experienced, you don't understand what's, is it, is it now the, the blinking image or is it a, a limited edition of the cover image or is it the actual record that you get access to or is it even a, whatever a right to distribute the song or whatever you you, you you crazy things you can you you can tokenize so and i think the uh, two things need to be uh, solved one is to to find a way to associate metadata and rights management information to the asset um verifiably um and and uh, that could import the metadata in a in a in a so more or less standardized standardized way, that would support the market in in my understanding to to be a bit bit more um, to have more standards also in regards of metadata and and rights management in, in information so that it's clear what you, what you are actually uh, purchasing. In a in a similar way, one of the other, I just put a link up in the chat, one of the other complications or problems I saw was with the, the young blockchain music startup Audius or Audius, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And the problem that they presumed or they discovered that the work of other people was being uploaded to it. And once it's up there, how do you take it down? How do you remove it? So that kind of goes back to what Heidi was saying earlier, which is that on a lot of these platforms, whether they're actually generating or aggregating or even selling the content, there is not only, well, it's all part of the supply and demand question, which is that if the supply becomes too great, then actually filtering or editing or uh, policing the content becomes very, very difficult. And I see that in two places. One would be with what Audius is going through, which is stuff is just being so enthusiastically uploaded. That includes things that legally should not be there. And secondly, um, maybe I'm just being a bit of a snob, but if you look at the content, especially of a lot of the visual artwork that's being turned into NFTs on a lot of these platforms, it's pretty horrible. It's the kind of stuff that you would, you would have seen air painted on the side of a van about you know, 30 years ago. So <laughs> there's the assumption that just because it's an NFT, it's fantastic investment. But you know, if we're talking about something you might wanna hang on your wall or pass on to your grandchildren, there's not much there that would interest me. The one place where I think there might be a tipping point is that uh, I've mentioned the Getty before, but UCLA is very close to the Getty Museum, right? Which is one of the wealthiest museums in the world. And I can't remember how much of this story I've told before, but one of the things that they're considering is whether or not they want to put some of their high resolution digital or digitized photography um, on the blockchain. 
um, because they lend out a lot of these super high images either to smaller regional museums where the resolution is so good you can actually display it on a wall and people might come but also to to students and scholars who might want to blow the thing up and actually look at the the artwork with greater resolution or greater greater magnification than you would be able to do in a physical museum where if you know if you push your nose against a Van Gogh, they'll probably rugby tackle you to the ground. Um, so, I mean, this is, I mean, this is an incredible time that we're living through, but um, as Brendan was saying, if you happen to invest thousands of hours or millions of dollars in one of these entities right now, there are a large number of um, horror stories which aren't being promoted, or not horror stories, the sort of um, the reservations that maybe should be promoted with equal volume. Um, to the, the, the positive or um, slightly over-enthusiastic material that we're seeing on, on breakfast television. But the idea, Brendan, what you were saying about cross-chain technology is something that, I mean, I would love to hear. I see already, for those of you who have your email on as well, I see already that David has sent out an invitation to you, to your guys, maybe together with Sebastian, where you can talk about the way that you've collaborated thus far. Um, because certainly what you've done with you know, with images in essence, right, um, is directly applicable to a lot of the assets that, that we'll be talking about. I mean, can anybody, maybe just as a final thought, what other um, bells and whistles have people seen embedded in or attached to the NFTs, spe specifically audio that would make it interesting over and above its inherent worth as a collectible? I mean, I mentioned lifetime concert tickets. Um, Eric mentioned access. Has anybody seen anything else that struck them as particularly interesting? What would make a, an audio file um, appealing if you did have qualms about its long-term worth as a as an investment? Artwork is one thing I've seen. So um, rare artwork. Yeah, Eric, your hand went up first. Yeah, that's one thing that I've noticed is that the uh, it's it's easy to attach a visual to the audio. To make it more appealing and make it more sort of dynamic, in in a way, I was uh, somebody had sent a link for this um, um, for a uh, sort of DAP conference or a DAO conference or something, and I was watching one of the videos on YouTube and the way that they uh, the way that these guys who are in the NFT space look at traditional art they they just think it's flat it just sits there it hangs on your wall you can't do anything with it and they want to be able to turn it around and dive and have it a little bit more dynamic and and so I think that's one thing that's interesting about the space is that you can have an audio file it's attached and, and there's so many different uh, aspects of of uh, of that that you can play with. Uh, Sebastian, your hands up. Just, uh, uh, I mean, Heidi mentioned uh, uh, a couple of, of um, uh, things that could be connected to an NFT, but uh, uh, I want to mention because it relates to what uh, John uh, said last uh, in our last call uh, to have like a vinyl uh, uh, limited edition as a physical object. And, and then uh, uh, this uh, blockchain uh, decentralized uh, uh, catalog of, of um, physical objects could come into play that you that you mentioned that I f find a, a super interesting uh, use case that could be connected to these uh, uh, to these um, a NFTs. So because then it, it relates back uh, to the physical uh, world of physical object and that might be something that is uh, the only way um, uh, for content that is uh, uh, abundant uh, and is there all the time. I mean, through streaming, you, you, it doesn't make any sen sense to own a piece of music un unless you actually uh, uh, buy the, the distribution rights or publishing rights uh, uh, to it in a way. So there needs to be some, uh, some way to the physical world. I, 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 I would assume. Yeah. Uh, Heidi just put up a, um, an observation that uh, VR images, um, hold on a second. Yes, AR and VR images are already being attached to the files. Um, Brendan, maybe it's just as a closing thought, what's the attention? Oh, there you are, there's one cool. right there. Heidi, that's cool. It. Yeah, that's neat. What would you, would you want to tell us about that, Heidi? And then I want, I want to ask Brendan with a closing thought about attention.live. 
Oh yeah, it was um, just a, a Twitter feed, but these are some AR, VR companies. Like I think Sensorian is Russian based, but they have an office in LA. Oban is China based with an office in LA and they're using um, avatars, AR, VR to attach to on top of these NFTs. That's cool. Could you send a link to the company? Yeah. Heidi? Oh, sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I was going to mention Attention Live, uh, Ian Utili. Um, he's um, created a platform that automatically generates NFTs around audio and audio clips, audio files. And um, he is an endless font of um, use cases for um, uh, audio and NF NFTs, uh, if you go out to his website, uh, Attention Live there, um, it's, it's, I've, it's been a while since I've been there, but it, it's useful to understand what he's doing. The other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, there's always all these questions that come up around when you talk about NFTs, about how many do you produce? And Euler Beats, um, that's spelled E-U-L-E-R, uh, Euler, Euler Beats, um, just issued uh, NFTs, it's generative art on the blockchain, and they're using bonding curves to set the price for each subsequent purchase. So they, they've got a list price at the, the, for the round one and round two, round three, and it gets pretty steep. And so it puts a cap on the total number of, um, the, this bonding curve uh, acts like a uh, it, it regulates the the, the, quant the price and the quantity, and it's a pretty powerful concept. Um, but sadly, I have to um, uh, jump off this call. I've really enjoyed it. Can't wait to connect next. Um, you've got my uh, email. Anybody out there should feel free to contact me anytime. Always glad to be in communication. Yeah, thanks for thanks joining us. Thanks very much. Bert, uh, seeing you again. Yeah. Thank, yeah, you, thank so you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brandon. I think it's time probably for most of us to go. So there's obviously a lot to be done between now and next time when hopefully we can get Brendan and Sebastian logically together to talk about the way that they've collaborated. Um, uh, I did have another thought, but it's just, it's just left my mind. Um, Heidi, maybe you and I could get together and talk more about using uh, Clubhouse. Um, if anybody has any other use cases they would like us to investigate, we will do so. We will upload the video. Um, in the meantime, we'll keep hammering it. Oh, you know what I would like to know more about is whether or not people have, um, in terms of the portability of this project uh, or its cross-platform potential, if anybody thinks that we would be better served looking simultaneously at another chain, I'd be very much um, interested to hear about that. But in the meantime, oh, sorry, Sebastian, I can see you moving as if you're about to. Yes, I was wondering uh, whether the uh, um, w whether this um, meeting uh, uh, time would be uh, like fixed uh, fixed uh, necessary um, uh, like uh, schedule. So, uh, do people prefer it? Um, no, regarding the time uh, for the next meeting, it will be. Uh, uh, Mm, uh, I think the European time will be 4 a.m. again. Oh, that's so right. Yeah, I, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, if I if I m may may raise the question whether uh, 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 the, there might might be some opportunities to reconsider that uh, time because it uh, it crushed me last time. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um. Uh, David, do you, want, do you want to speak about the, the ease or complexity of changing a time? Sure. So I just dropped a link to the calendar so everybody has it. I mean, as of right now, I know today was an exception, but as of right now, we're still alternating between Asia friendly and Europe friendly. So the next call in two weeks is Asia friendly. And then David, let me know if this still works. But then the call after that and two more weeks is going back to the normal Europe friendly time at 9 a.m. Pacific. Yeah, and if our, if our clocks change, I think on the fourteenth, does that make it oh, better yeah, the, or worse for Europe? Yeah, the that change is coming. So fallback, spring forward. So then, then, then it would be then be better for you, wouldn't it? If our clocks go forward, because then the time difference will be less. For or is two, everybody's for, brain? For, just... I think it's for for two weeks, if they, and then yeah, it regu yeah. and then it regularizes. 
Yeah. But I mean, the, in general, we can meet whenever we as a group choose to meet, but this, the current schedule that we've established was this alternating pattern. And does the- or we, could, we, or we could refuse to work together unless we meet one day in Reykjavik or somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Okay, yeah, but I'll talk to David about a way that, that is fair. It's because I agree Sebastian and Jerome are not getting a very good deal at the moment. Yeah, sure. Yeah, David, you and I can talk offline about that. Okay. So in the meantime, thanks very much. And I'll see you guys um, hopefully a couple of weeks from now. Yeah. In the meantime, you know, please, please write with ideas, criticism. Oh, there's one more question. Do what you want to do. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Um, when people are looking at stuff, uh, when I, I'm really excited about how CryptoKitties, you can breed the cats and people can get together and make a, a, a third cat. Uh, and I feel like for music sampling and, and what music is about, that's really cool. They use scarcity to kind of create abundance by you know having just general people with their cats or their uh, bass line and someone with the drum line. If there's some kind of collaboration that can happen, happen with that. So if anyone sees something out there that's in the music space that's doing what CryptoKitties has done, that would be great to hear about. I can certainly see people turning, for example, stems into NFTs, right? So you might be able to buy a drum beat or a bass line from a musician, and then you could say, well, this is an official bass line. It's a copyrighted bass line, which is unlikely given the repetitious nature of popular music. But those building blocks, yeah, might make sense as, yeah, a, as breeding, something. Yeah, sorry, a breeding concept. Yeah, it's a, it's a breeding concept. That's what's fascinating. So for visual art, they figured out how to do a breeding thing. And so they had this one Brazilian artist who created the basics and then uh, the, the uh, like Lego pieces and then the breeding is putting those together. So that's what it would be like in music. And I think there could be some some way like that, but that would be very inventive. So I haven't seen that yet. And that would be really cool. If some, some Why don't you and I talk about that before next time and then we'll, we'll showcase some stuff. Cool. Okay. Sorry, Sebastian. No matter whenever we speak to you, you always look like someone from a, a gothic castle because it's never sunshine. It's always dark and shadow. And... So you have the instruments of torture behind you. <laughs> it's also the light. I need to, to, to find a better, better okay. setup. <laughs> okay. See you later. Thank you, David. Bye. David, both. Everyone.